Hello, Japan! Hello! <laughs> Thank you all for coming. You know, I haven't been in Japan since before COVID. I used to come here about every six months to a year. And it's good to be back. It really is. It's one of the most beautiful countries, and we are some of the kindest and just the most incredible people. Cardano, very long ago, got started here in Japan. It was 2015. It was a very different time in the world. Than you know, we're going through a lot of changes right now in the Cardano ecosystem, so it's given me the uh, opportunity to reflect a bit on my own life and how the world has changed since I was born. Uh, some of you who know me know I was born in Hawaii, of all places. I was born in this little island in Maui, a little town called Wailuku. I grew up in a town called Makawa. And when I was young, I used to take my bicycle and drive my bicycle to the library, and I would put books in and drive them back from Hawaii is it always rains every single day. So if you really wanted to read something, you had to wrap it in a plastic bag, put it in a bicycle, take it home, get rained on. You really had to work for that knowledge. <laughs> it took in the 80s and 90s, and every decade before, until the event of the internet, time and effort and money to move information. And that's the way the world was structured. That's why we have big cities, that's why we have large universities, that's why people try to aggregate themselves around information hubs. You have Tokyo and London and Wall Street, you have Silicon Valley, you have these places. You're close to where everybody knows each other, everybody can talk to each other. Then the internet comes out, and suddenly we can instantaneously move information anywhere in the world to anybody. And we weren't prepared as a global society for the consequences of that. Our governments weren't prepared, our democratic processes weren't prepared, our institutions weren't prepared, our businesses weren't prepared, our media wasn't prepared, and we thought decade by decade that we were getting a handle on it. The challenge is that when people can talk to each other, people can coordinate with each other, they can collaborate with each other, they can do business with each other. In the last 30 years, since we really all started getting online, we've had a conversations about how does the entire world change because of this, including the nature of money itself. When I was born, when many of you were born, money was a very regional concern with a parent, the U.S. dollar, behind it. Or if you lived in the Soviet system, they had their own way of doing things. The world was basically bipolar, one way or the other. And there was a very good defined order. What is money? How does it work? How does banking work? How do financial services work? Then suddenly, if people say information can move instantaneously, why should money move instantaneously? And then suddenly, if information can be digital, why should money be digital? And that led to the rise of the cryptocurrency movement. That was there in the very beginning, very early days. I know that because Bitcoin was worthless and we had to pay for our own coffee and nobody cared about us. <laughs> Those were good times. They were fun times because everything was philosophical. Nothing was about tokens. Nothing was about making money. And we just got to talk about how can we make a better world. The core of both of these concepts, the movement of information and the movement of money, really what you're talking about is how in a global world where people don't trust each other, where you don't want to put somebody in charge, can you build a system where we can trust each other and we don't need people in charge? When you look at the lens of the economic, political, and social systems, when we talk about impact, what we're really talking about is that we live in a world of the haves and have-nots. Some people have money. Some people have clean drinking water. Some people have clean air. Some people have wonderful real estate beautiful neighborhood. Some people have safety. Some people have certainty about their life, that the investments they make, the world around them is stable and secure. Japan as a country has invested so much collective effort in becoming 
one of the most beautiful and stable nations on the planet. Having traveled to 74 countries, I can assure what you have here is a very rare thing. There are so many people, billions of which, they live with the have-not. Rampant inflation, they live with unsafe water, unsafe food, war, as we've seen in Ukraine, we've seen in the Middle East, we see in Ethiopia, we see in so many places around. And if you want to rebuild the economic, political, and social systems, what you're trying to do is get rid of the haves and have-nots, just replace it all with everybody has. Pretty simple, pretty hard to do. The reason being is that the systems of the legacy world were never designed with this type of view. They were designed for a world where information doesn't move instantaneously. They were designed for a world of kings and strong men and strong leaders. They were designed for a world where people don't travel. And they were designed for a world where we don't do business with each other like we do today on the internet. So when you talk about impact, you really have to think, this is not about raising money. This is not about somehow mastering a pitch or convincing people to help out or starting a business or figuring out how to build a well for a particular country in a particular jurisdiction, a particular village. This is ultimately a question about systems. And we've done this before as people. When we look at the 18th century and we look at where the world was at in the 18th century, the vast majority of people in the world lived on farms. They didn't travel more than 50 miles during their entire lifetime. They were illiterate, they couldn't read. They followed whatever particular faith that they grew up with and had no ability to choose their own leaders. This was the lived experience for pretty much the vast majority of the entire human race, regardless if you were born in China or Japan or even the United States or Europe, any of the European powers, they had kings. Then we look at the rise of the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution, and suddenly all the people started moving into a different system. They stopped working on farms, they started working on factories, mass education occurred, people started reading, they started collaborating with each other, travel became incredibly easy. We had railroads, and then later on we had automobiles, and then we entered the 20th century, we have airplanes, and the world radically changed. Now, did our government stay static? Are we all ruled by kings? No, we started embracing at the same time, it's not a coincidence, a completely new model of governance. We started embracing republics and democracies. We started embracing this concept of bottom-up instead of top-down. We started embracing free market capitalism, these types of systems. So the thing is that technology is the key driver of social progress. When new technology comes about, it inspires people to look at the world differently, think about the world differently, to talk to each other differently, to think about themselves differently. And because of that, they start looking at their communities, they start looking at their neighborhoods, they start looking at the world around them, and they start saying, hang on a second here, why are we led by these people? Look at the United States. This election that we have until recently was dementia versus demented. We have two people in their late 70s running against each other who have no conception of how the world really works. They remember how the world was, but they have no material connection into where the world is, arguing over how they're going to restore and put everything back to the way it used to be. But the thing is, technology doesn't let you do that. Is everybody here going to turn in their iPhones? Are you going to stop using the internet? Are you going to stop getting your news online? Are you going to stop participating in digital lives, stop playing video games? You're going to get rid of your friend network and move back into farms? No. You can't go back once a philosophy has come, an idea has come. So what the cryptocurrency space has been about, part of it has been a discussion of what is sound money. And that's what the mainstream media reports and what we as an industry most vocally broadcast. Because you have tokens, and they go up and they go down, and people become rich, they become millionaires and billionaires, and people lose spectacular fortunes. And it's fun and exciting to talk about these things. But at the heart of it, it's really about the technology, an exponential technology, a technology few people can build, but it impacts the lives of billions. 
that allows you to start talking around how do you rewrite the DNA of the economic, political, and social systems of the world as a whole. So a lot of people talk, for example, about climate change or environmentalism. It's something that's near and dear to my heart. I live on a ranch, and I have bison. The prior owners of that ranch, they dumped a lot of trash, and now I have lead in certain parts of my soil. And I have other contaminants. Back in the 1950s, they didn't care about these things, but I've lived the consequences of it. You see, so I'd love to live in a world where things are clean. I'd love to live in a world where we don't believe climate change is going to cause catastrophic harm. Why can't we stop it? Because it's an economic and a systemic issue. It's an incentives issue at its core. What cryptocurrencies are about, the blockchain industry is about, is about rebuilding and realigning incentives. You look no further than Bitcoin, you get the incentives right, you go from a single person on a single laptop designing a protocol to 15 years later, thousands of mining pools all around the world, vertically integrated data centers, a huge ecosystem worth $2 trillion collectively. There was no bureaucracy, there was no government endorsement, there was no agency of Bitcoin, there was no spokesman that went around every day and said, you should adopt this. No, it was just simply getting the incentives right, and once people had those incentives, they started working together, they started collectively coming together, and then suddenly we're there. When you think about environmental problems, they're much the same ways. You have to get every company in the world to wake up and start thinking about how they do their business differently. And even if you have the power of the law on your side, how do you in a multipolar world get everybody to get along? The U.S. won't follow the Chinese regulations, nor will they follow the Russian. We're kind of in a conflict with each other. The Chinese won't follow the U.S. standard. The Russians won't follow the U.S. standard. So what are we going to do? Pass a law for half the world? Well, we live in one world. It's one order. Doesn't make any sense. So you need incentives to push people along. Where people don't do it because the law says so, they do it because it's in their best interest and it's profitable. This is the first great lesson of my career being in the cryptocurrency space for so long, is that we as an industry, one of our first and most powerful tools is the ability to talk around how to incentivize people to do certain things. Some of you are entrepreneurs in this room. Some of you are trying to build startups, You're trying to create things. What's the number one thing you have to do in a digital startup? You have to get users. Where do you find your users? How do you get your users to join? How do they participate? It's an incentives issue. Why? Because they have finite time. And they're trying to make a decision. Do I spend my time in your product and service or somebody else's? So what incentive do they have? You have to figure it out. That's why our industry is so powerful and it's grown so quickly is that we were able as an industry to collectively think about open source and start standardizing different patterns of incentives. It's a really powerful tool. And if you're an environmentalist, you're thinking about how do I solve that problem, that is an example of a tool that you should master and learn. The legislative tool never works because people always try to find a way to get around it. And even if you have a stable structure, what happens when a war breaks out? What happens when politics fall apart? The old understandings and orders, they just don't work. And if your laws contradict the incentives of the participants, the participants are going to cheat. That's a human reality. When we think about political systems, one of the biggest issues that comes up is inclusion. Disenfranchising people, either directly or indirectly. The sanctity of the vote. In Venezuela, they just had an election. Her president's holding on to power. The person in the opposition party says he won. Who won? Well, probably the opposition party. But do we know? We don't know. Why? Because we don't actually know if the ballot is secure. We see this all throughout the world. Russia just had an election. I don't know if many people here believe that it was a fair ballot. Putin arrests his political opponents. This is happening in America, too. And so how do you have stable political systems if half or more of your population feel that what they're voting on doesn't count and they're being disenfranchised and left behind? Does the government by and for the government have legitimacy? And how do you make controversial, difficult decisions if people don't feel like they're part of that system. Again, when we look at the cryptocurrency industry, blockchain industry, we have the single hardest government's problem to solve. You have these protocols that live in every country at the same time. 
every language, every set of values, every group of people. And somehow we have to collectively come together, even though we don't know each other, and there's really no incentive for us to come together natively, and agree on things in order to upgrade the system for the greater good of everybody. That's a governance problem at its core. And people have to trust that when those decisions are made and the system upgrades, that the majority of the system was along for the ride and they actually agreed to do this. So, under the hood, in addition to being incentives engineers, we're political scientists inside this industry. We have to figure out how to build voting systems. We have to figure out how to incentivize people to vote and participate. We have to figure out how to resolve conflict because we don't have militaries and police forces. And we don't have all the things nation states have to force people to get along. People have to consent. And we also have to work against the tides of social media. The reality is, algorithmically speaking, all the major platforms in social media, they're built for you to participate and click, which means they're built to make you upset and outraged. They focus on the negative, not the positive. So when you look at these types of things, that translates to what? It translates to people not getting along. Well, I see this in my own experience. Growing up in America, when I was a kid in the 80s and 90s, most of us didn't know the political preferences of the people sitting next to us and didn't care. Now, it's so polarized and extreme, people don't talk to their family members anymore. They don't go to holidays and events. People hate each other, people they've never met, just off the basis of their political preferences. It's how polarized and how bad it's gotten. It's only getting worse. It's a problem. Well, I have to take those same group of people and I have to get them, for governance reasons, to actually talk to each other, like each other, trust each other, work together in some way or fashion to discuss how to upgrade these types of systems, which means we have to actually look at completely new ways of communicating and organizing. Why is this relevant? Well, we have to do the exact same thing for social impact. We have to somehow get, despite the fact that Russia is in a proxy war with America, Russia and America did agree on certain things and work together on certain things for the greater good of people. The same for China. They have to work together in some way. They don't like each other. They don't trust each other. They don't really want to talk to each other. But we have to be adults because there are problems that are larger than all of us. When we look at the other exponential technologies of the 21st century, this is probably the biggest example of where we need to work together. For example, many people in this room are very excited and some are worried about the prospect of AI. It's very powerful. It's an incredible tool. And everybody's working on it. Russian scientists are working on it. Chinese scientists are working on it. We're just about to speak at Tokyo Tech tomorrow. There's amazing professors there at that institution who are working on AI. And one of the big words of AI is alignment. So the question is, how do you align AI? So it's in our best interest as people. Don't we have to work together and talk to each other? collaborate with each other to come up with a common definition of what is our best interest. If you ask Vladimir Putin, what is your best interest, you know, for the Russian people, he'll say, well, it's Vladimir Putin's best interest. Is that equivalent to the people of Japan or the people of America, or vice versa, the United States? And you say, what's the best interest of AI? It's of all preserving the American way of life. You guys are all okay with that, right? Some are. I'm an American. I don't know. That's the issue. So, governance. You have to upgrade protocols. Why? Because that's the only way we make progress. AI. You have to align the protocol. You see, it's a very common threat right there. It's this incredible technology, fire from the gods. We have it in our hands, and we can use it. We can do something with it. But we need governance to be able to make decisions about how to align it so that it's fair. Because we're handing this off to our children. And we don't fully understand what that means and how powerful this is, and also its consequences to society. It's the same in synthetic biology. So I'm a serial entrepreneur. Most of you know me from Ethereum or Cardano, if you know me at all. And for those of you who don't know me, allow me to introduce myself. I build companies for a living. So in addition to Cardano, I also have companies like Ghostfire, where I genetically engineer plants, and we make them glow in the dark. And we use them to sequester carbon, and we do all kinds of other cool things. I have a clinic in Gillette, Wyoming, with my dad and brother, who are doctors. And we do regenerative medicine and anti-aging. So we take stem cells, and we slow down the aging. We do agriculture. We even have an aerospace project that we work on. 
And in all these things, synthetic biology is the one that scares me the most because there is very little regulation, there's very little coordination or policy understanding of what this is. When you talk about changing the world, you can talk about feeding everybody. You can talk about cleaning up the environment. You can talk about geoengineering on a grand scale. You can talk about all kinds of new materials. Using synthetic biology, you can make silkworms make spider silk. And then suddenly you have something five times stronger than steel and half the weight. How would that change the world? You can do magic and wonders. And just like AI, where it's fire from the gods, how do you regulate that? How do you control that? How do we actually get people to talk to each other? So there's a lesson in the blockchain industry. The very same principles and concepts that allow us to govern each other, the voting systems, the incentive systems, all of these things, can be applied also to synthetic biology. You have a conversation, a discussion about how do you regulate the intellectual property, the research interests, all of these types of things. In addition to this, when you look at the social systems, I've often thought about how do you build social systems where we get away from where we're at. One of the biggest problems, meta problems, in this next generation is that people are burnt out, fatigued, and they're turning off. We're tired because there's so much conflict, there's so much anger and hate, and there's just negative discourse. Social media has broken the world. It's different today. It feels different from when I was a kid. So we need new social media, and we need the ability to actually have fact-based dialogues with each other. AI exacerbates this problem. You have generative AI, you have the ability instantaneously to create voice clips and pictures. We see this in the Cardano ecosystem where people do giveaway scams, and they take a video of me, and they say, hey, I'm giving away free data. Rather innocuous, but fraud. So you have politics, where people make fake pictures and fake videos, and the capability of this is growing exponentially. And that's just one of thousands of dimensions of division that exists. So when we talk about rebuilding the economic, political, and social systems, how do you build social systems where not only people get together and collaborate and they talk to each other, but how do you build social systems where people are addicted to and love objective reality and truth? They actually want to find it. That's what created the Enlightenment for mankind. The big change in the 18th, the 19th, the 20th century is we started following the scientific process. We abandoned mysticism, we abandoned superstition, and we started saying repeatability and objectivity and separating the person making the argument from the argument is the basis of truth. And by following this, we can build a great society that each generation gets to inherit, build on top of, instead of tear down. And in following that, we went from an agrarian society to a society that could go to the moon, a society that could build the internet, that can cure cancers, a society that has all this wondrous technology around us. We are now regressing where humanity is starting to go back to a subjective experience. Objective reality is falling apart. People no longer care about the argument. They care about the person making the argument. Do I like that person? Do I not like that person? If I don't like that person, I don't care about the merits of the argument. It's wrong because I don't like them. So we talk about impact. And you say, this is a problem. There's ethnic cleansing happening. There is toxic waste going into the water. There is uh, racial bias that's occurring. There's discrimination that's occurring. And you have all this evidence that you've spent years of your life aggregating together and thinking about. And then you present it. How disheartening it is, after all the time and effort that you put in, the person listening to you is going to base the truth of that solely on who are you to them, rather than the evidence you have. How do we make progress if that's the case? Because the problem with social media is its job is to make everybody hate each other. Because when you hate each other, you have the highest level of engagement, the highest level of clicks, the highest level of interaction with the ads and the algorithms. So yet again, the cryptocurrency industry. We have strong divisions in this industry. There's a lot of hate. Solana versus Cardano, Cardano versus Solana, Ethereum versus that, the Bitcoin maxes calling everybody evil. And they have financial incentives to hate each other beyond just that I don't like the person. My token go up, their token go down. So we as an industry are running into this issue at the moment. We're trying to figure it out. We're trying to solve it. But at the core of it, 
What does a blockchain do? It's an immutable, time-stamped, irreversible record of truth. When something gets appended to it, you can't change it. And then everybody gets to see it. Everybody gets to talk about it. Everybody gets to think about it. That creates an anchor upon which you can start regaining objective reality. I would argue this is probably the most important part for society because we can't make political progress, we can't make economic progress, we can't make social progress if we don't have objective reality because we have no means of discussing what is progress as a society. We have no common reference to it. If my lived experience is positive, I don't think there's anything wrong with the world. If all my neighbors are happy and I'm happy, I'm rich, my water's clean, I feel like I have a voice, then it's impossible for me to get outside of that bubble and then say, well, there's other people somewhere else in the world who have it worse off than me. Because I don't believe it, I don't see it, I don't have that framework. So you can't make change, you can't make impact. So I hope I can convey that technology is kind of the arc of human history and it's what changes everything. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, the top technology was figuring out flint craft. My ranch up in Wyoming, one of my favorite things to do is to walk around. I find old pieces of flint, pick them up, you have arrowheads and axe heads. That was technology. And it was amazing because they actually could hunt with that. They could make bows with that, another piece of technology, make axes. And then they figure out fire. Then after that, figure out the wheel and agriculture and all these things. And then suddenly we have civilization. But technology moved in millennia and centuries. If you found an axe head from 100,000 BC and compared it to one on my ranch, made maybe in 10,000 or 15,000 BC, they look roughly the same. Can you imagine 85,000 years of human history and the only innovation is maybe they get a little better at making axe heads? It's pretty crazy. We're used to, because of modern society, technology speeding up. Then you look at today, and we've gone from the year 2000 to 2024, from desktop computers and 56K and crappy graphics to literally a private space industry, to augmented reality, to artificial intelligence, to miracle innovation in nanotechnology, to a small company in Dallas making plants glow in the dark, to the ability to go to Mars at some point, fusion reactors that actually work it's pretty remarkable and extraordinary how it's speeding out. So technology is feeding into creating more technology. The more of it we have, the more social change we're forced into. You can't stay static. And that's why blockchain exists. Because somebody somewhere who we don't know came to the realization that if we're going to get out of this fast pace of technology, we need to have some form of technology to help regulate us as people. Our governments can't do it, especially if they weren't built for the technology of this time. We can't do it because human beings are implicitly subjective. We're not objective. We're biased. I like me. You like you. I think my arguments are pretty good. You think your arguments are pretty good. That's how it works. And that's okay. That's who we are. That's how humanity works. The point of rationalism and scientific method was to try to create a construct to depersonalize it so that we can actually talk to each other in a different way, accepting that we're flawed. Well, we need to do this on a society scale, a civilization scale. And so when we think about impact, I encourage you to take a step back and realize that all the tools that you need for your particular projects are there. They exist, but they're in boxes, unassembled. The job of our generation is not to be so brilliant that we come up with a solution to everything. It's to realize that the prior generations gave us a gift of innovation. They gave us so many amazing government systems and approaches and all the knowledge you could ever want. And for the first time in human history, not only do we have access to it, because of AI, regardless of who you are or what your skill sets, you can actually learn from it. You don't have to be a nuclear physicist to understand fusion reactors anymore. You don't have to be a mathematician to read math papers anymore. You don't have to be a computer scientist to write code anymore. You get that for free because of these tools. So they're all there. They're all in boxes. And the challenge is to take them out and understand that the core of it is we have to get along and figure out how to do that. And we have to create the incentives for that. 
And then we have to recognize what blockchain does is it gives us a true neutral commons that's above humanity once you come up with a logic to hold everybody accountable. That's the magic of what this industry has done. And actually watching it for the last 12 years and from my TED talk to today, I'm never more hopeful. Going to real life use cases, right now in Kenya, we're servicing loans, microfinance loans. When I did my TED talk, it was a hypothetical construction. I used Afghanistan as an example. Turned out it was Kenya. We're getting it done. At Hyperledger, we have a project called Adentist, where we're creating an identity stack that has a completely new notion of how to identify people and build credit scores where people own that. With Cardano, we coordinate on a scale of millions of people, a centralized government. Didn't exist in 2015, just today, right here, right now. And we're learning in real time how to write a constitution, how to elect people, how to build completely new ballot systems. There are dozens of projects talking about new social networks. Veracity bonds, prediction markets for truth. When you look across our industry as a whole, all the projects of it, there's so many tools in those boxes. And all you have to do is take the time to get to learn those tools, to integrate those tools. And I have no doubt if you do so, you can take advantage of the single most powerful tool of our industry in that it is exponential. Humanity is not used to this. The first technology to do that is nuclear weapons. When you put a little bit in, you get a lot out. Much to the horror of humanity when we discovered it. Well, there's plenty of exponential technology. Because of the nature of this technology, five or ten people working together diligently can build something that can impact the lives of billions of people. You don't need to be a billionaire. You don't need to be the head of a country. You don't need to have giant networks. You just have to get the right initial condition and launch it with the right incentive set, just like Bitcoin's growth, which went from nothing to 450 million people, $2 trillion of the ecosystem in 15 years, you could do the same. That's how you change the world, is you have to understand that the world to change needs new systems, and every person in this world, in this room, can actually now be a first class citizen in changing those systems, <coughs> upgrading the systems, updating the systems. So thank you for listening, I do appreciate it. I always love these events, I get to talk a little bit more philosophically, uh, but I can assure you, we are making amazing progress and uh, I can't wait to see what all of you build and what we can do to make the world a better place instead of a worse one. Cheers.